Welcome to the abdominal wall. We're going to start out here by talking about the muscles, and in another lecturette we'll talk about the innervation to the abdominal wall. Our objectives for this section is going to be able to visualize the location and extent of the abdominal muscles and their aponeuroses. And then also when we consider making an abdominal incision, we want to be able to rightly identify the fiber direction of the muscles encountered as we make the decision. Um, it's important because we're not going to make incisions that are going to transect the muscle fibers, but that are going to run parallel to the muscle fibers. And then also we want to be able to identify the borders of the paralumbar fossa and compare the structures that we encounter when we make an incision in the paralumbar fossa in the horse versus the ox. Okay, in this image of the horse, we find that the deep fascia of the thorax and lumbar apaxial muscles is called the thoracolumbar fascia. The dorsoscapular ligament is part of this. This fascia is going to attach to the spinous processes of the supraspinous ligament of the thorax, lumbar, and sacral vertebra. Okay, the cutaneous trunchi muscle lies superficial to this fascia. And notice in this image of the bovine that the cutaneous trunchi muscle does not extend up into that most dorsal region of the flank, and so it will not be within that paralumbar fossa. Unlike the dog, the cutaneous trunchi muscle is also innervated by cutaneous branches of the spinal nerves. Over the external abdominal oblique muscle, we're going to find that deep fascia continues as the abdominal tunic. This will then blend with the aponeuroses of this muscle. The abdominal tunic, as we see in herbivores, is going to contain, contain a lot of elastic fiber, giving it the yellow color. And that's so it can support the heavy viscera of the abdomen. As we see here, the external abdominal oblique muscle originates from the 5th through 18th ribs. It's going to insert partially upon the tuber cocci and then also on the prepubic tendon. Of course, it also attaches in linea alba. Between the tuber cocci and the prepubic tendon, we have a thickening, which is known as the inguinal ligament. This is truly thickened and strengthened, unlike what we saw in the dog. We're going to also find that 2 to 3 centimeters cranial to the pubis, 4 to 5 centimeters from the medium plane. Within the aponeurosis of the external abdominal oblique, we find a 10 to 12 centimeter slit like opening, which is the superficial inguinal ring. Okay, so this is just a potential space until something passes through it. Okay, also in the horse, we find that the femoral fascia on the medial thigh is attached to the aponeurosis of the external abdominal oblique muscle by what is called the femoral lamina. This is important because when a stallion stands up on his hind limbs, when he's mounting a mare, this femoral lamina is going to, because it attaches close to that superficial inguinal ring, it's going to widen that superficial inguinal ring, increasing the potential for herniation through the ring. When we do have hernias, they are classified as inguinal hernias when the loop of bowel stays within that inguinal ring, but as it, if it passes down into the scrotum, then it's known as a scrotal hernia. Okay, here we're looking at the external abdominal oblique muscle in the bovine. It's going to be attaching to the caudal border and lateral surfaces of ribs 6 through 13. Then attaches to the tuber coxae and the prepubic tendon and linea alba, just as it did in the horse. Okay, the internal abdominal oblique muscle. It's going to originate from the tuber coxae in the horse. It's going to be adjacent to the inguinal ligament. It's going to then attach to the cartilages of the last four to five ribs and the linea alba and also the prepubic tendon. Here we can now see the border of the paralumbar fossa. Notice that the caudal ventral border is going to be 
the internal abdominal oblique muscle. So here we have the external abdominal oblique reflected so that we can see that internal abdominal oblique muscle. Remember the external abdominal oblique muscle fibers were going caudal ventral in direction. The internal abdominal oblique are going cranial ventral in direction. The aponeurosis of the internal abdominal oblique is going to fuse with that of the external and they're going to form the external rectus sheath. We find that the ventral to the origin of this internal abdominal oblique muscle on the inguinal ligament is the slit known as the deep inguinal ring. Okay, so the deep inguinal ring is bound cranially by the edge of the internal abdominal oblique muscle, caudally by the inguinal ligament. And so we have then created an inguinal canal basically going from the deep inguinal ring to the superficial inguinal ring. Notice that the superficial and deep inguinal rings are not just right up against each other, but in general you have to, if you put your hand through the superficial inguinal ring, you need to go caudally and dorsally to find that deep inguinal ring. So you don't want to have your hand fishing around between the two muscles looking for a cryptorchidestis. When you need to go more caudally and dorsally. The inguinal canal is present in both the male and the female. In the male we do have the spermatic cord and structures within the vaginal tunic passing through that. In both the male and the female we are going to see the external pudendal artery and genital femoral nerve pass through. Okay here's the internal abdominal oblique muscle in the Ox, notice that not only does it come off the tuber coxae, but it also comes off the deep lumbar fascia at the level of the longissimus lumborum muscle, and so we do find it within that paralumbar fossa. Ventral border here, caudal ventral border, is that part of the internal abdominal oblique that comes off the tuber coxae whereas we do have some of that internal abdominal oblique muscle that's actually going to be within the paralumbar fossa. Okay, so here's the bovine paralumbar fossa, ventral to the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebra, caudal to the last rib, and dorsal to the portion of internal abdominal oblique muscle that originates from the tuber coxae. Okay. So when we make a paralumbar incision, we're going to see the external abdominal oblique muscle, internal abdominal oblique muscle. Remember in the equine that generally does not come off the lumbar region, only comes off the tuber coxae, so we will not see that in the equine. We have seen in some of these ponies some muscle up in that region, so there is some variation. But in general, we will not consider it within the paralumbar fossa. And then we have the transverse abdominus muscle also encountered. So in the bovine, you're going to encounter all three of these abdominal muscles, whereas in the equine, generally, you will only encounter the external abdominal oblique and the transverse abdominus muscles. Okay, let's pick up back with this transverse abdominus muscle. It's going to originate off the distal medial surface of the external ribs and the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebra. It's going to come down and attach to the linea alba. It's not going to extend caudally enough to attach to the prepubic tendon. The aponeurosis of this is going to form our internal rectus sheath. The rectus abdominis muscle is going to come off the cartilages of the 4th through ninth ribs and the sternum. And it is going to form the prepubic tendon which will then attach to the pubis. Okay, we've mentioned several times about the prepubic tendon. It's the tendon of insertion for the rectus abdominis muscle. But it's also going to serve as attachment for the abdominal oblique muscles the gracilis muscle and the pectineus muscle. From either side in the horse we find that the prepubic tendon is going to give off the 
accessory ligament of the femoral head. Remember that's going to run in that pubic groove on the skeleton. Along with the ligament of the femoral head, this is going to help secure the femur in the acetabulum so we don't get luxation.